um, of open grassland, we would call prairie. Oak savanna, where you have scattered trees with prairie plants underneath. And then oak woodlands, which also has kind of a grassland understory component, but you now have a closed uh, tree canopy. And what all of these share is, is that they're fire dependent. I'll, I'll talk about that in some detail uh, now. So what we're seeing here in Wisconsin, because we're moister than the central part of the US, um, we have this constant process of ecological succession, uh, starting with, with grasslands where you would have that in drier areas like the central and western part of the country. Um, as time progresses around here, um, you start to get some woody plants like shrubs showing up. Uh, the native ones are things like sumac and prickly ash. Um, and then eventually a few scattered trees get established and you form uh, an oak or oak hickory savanna. And eventually those trees uh, become more crowded together. You get a closed canopy. Um, but at some point this actually changes. We're right on the borderline between this sort of prairie grassland based ecosystem and the eastern deciduous forests where that are dominated by trees like maples and basswoods. And those have, uh, when you reach that so-called climax forest, it has a very different uh, character. The, um, the, under, the, the tree canopy is completely closed um, and the leaves are so dense that there's very little growing in the understory other than spring ephemeral plants that actually get all their flowering and, and blooming done before the trees leaf out um, in the spring. Um, so this process of ecological succession, um, at least in this part of the country and with our soils and, and climate, is what happens when uh, you just sort of leave things undisturbed over uh, decades or hundreds of years, this will eventually happen and you'll end up with this, this uh, very closed low light maple basswood forest. But that's only if this is left undisturbed. But of course, uh, disturbance is very much a part of nature. And there, there are kind of four basic kinds of disturbance that you can see on this type of landscape. Um, there are catastrophic events like uh, uh, storms. If you have a tornado or one of those big downdraft storms come through and knock all the trees down, um, that will set this clock back uh, to the beginning, to the, to the grassland stage. Um, drought and wet cycles also play a part in this. If, if it gets dry enough, the trees are less able to survive than the grassland, and that will certainly play a part. Um, large herbivores, uh, bison and elk can play a large part um, in this where they're present. But uh, really the dominant type of disturbance that uh, keeps these prairies and oak savannas and oak woodlands um, in place is fire. Um, and, and that has been true uh, historically as well as in recent times. And, and so um, if we were to turn back the clock to what Wisconsin looked like uh, before the European settlement in the early 1800s, um, what you would see is something like this. Uh, the southwestern half, if you will, of the state was this kind of mosaic checkerboard of prairie, oak savanna, and then related fire-dependent wetland areas. And a little further north, you have some of this, of course, in central Wisconsin, you also have not just oak savannas, but also pine barrens, where you have these really dry areas, kind of like an oak savanna, but uh, really more like a pine savanna. Um, and all of those four systems are actually very dependent on frequent burning to be maintained. Um, where there was not so much burning, you, uh, it would succeed all the way into forest, which is what we have in the sort of northwestern half of Wisconsin. 
Now, I'm sure some of you have seen these maps before. And, and for those of you who don't know how these were created, you may wonder, how do we know what the vegetation actually looked like before Europeans um, arrived here? And the answer was uh, in the early 1800s, uh, where I live in Dane County, this was done in 1837. Um, the U.S. government sent out surveyors, of course, to survey the land for settlement. And at each of the points along the survey in their grid, uh, the surveyors took very careful notes about what vegetation they were seeing. Um, and this is an example of one of those notes. I don't know exactly where this is located, but it, it says on the second line here that they're entering a prairie and they talk about bur oaks and, and, uh, and other uh, types of uh, trees that you would see in this prairie savanna landscape. And so uh, a number of scientists, uh, UW uh, Madison in particular, starting with John Curtis, um, took these surveyor notes and actually uh, turned them into these kinds of maps. They could actually reconstruct what type of vegetation was present on the landscape um, just from these, these surveyor notes. So as a result of all this disturbance um, and, and, uh, and fire dependency, frequent burning, prairie plants have a number of um, important characteristics. One is that even though that they're mostly flowers and grasses, they can be extraordinarily long lived. Um, compass, this is a, a compass plant, kind of the iconic uh, plant of the prairie. Um, and this is one that was uh, 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 planted in 1992 um, on the Foxglove Savanna uh, near Sauk City, Wisconsin. And uh, in 1999, uh, when this uh, girl, this uh, girl, uh, Anna Barzen was uh, born the year this particular compass plant was actually planted. So she was seven years old when it first flowered. And then um, uh, almost 20 years later, uh, the same plant is still going strong and it's actually still there. Um, and in fact, uh, compass plants can live to be a century, uh, 100 years old, which uh, I think is kind of astonishing. We think of flowers as being relatively short lived, but uh, not, uh, not so much with prairie plants. Um, and part of the reason for this is that their roots go way deep. If, if you're a plant that's going to get burned to the ground every year, potentially, uh, most of the plant has to actually be underground. And uh, these, these uh, plants need to be able to go down deep for water and other nutrients. And so a, a prairie uh, a grassland will have uh, anywhere from 60 to 75% of its biomass um, actually underground, even in the middle of the summer when the grass may be, you know, five, six feet high, um, you still have uh, the majority of the biomass um, underground. So why do these plants actually need fire? What is the fire doing for them? Well, the, the most important thing is that they're, the fire is, is suppressing the woody vegetation. Um, it's basically setting back that succession process. Um, and so it's suppressing uh, the shrubs and trees. And the, the shrubs and trees that are adapted to this landscape, like oak trees, bur oaks and white oaks in particular, um, are actually able to survive fire when they're little, when they're small seedlings, they're, um, they're able to be burned to the ground and their roots will continue to, uh, to grow and the plant will re-sprout, even if it's burned to the ground every single year. Um, so uh, that, that suppression of, uh, of uh, the woody plants is, of course, really important. But also, when you, you, know, you look at a prairie like this time of year, there's a lot of dead plant litter and thatch left over from the, the prior year. 
and uh, and that gets removed. And particularly the early blooming prairie plants um, are dependent on that so that they can come up through the ground and uh, get some light uh, even underneath uh, what would have been several feet of thatch if you don't burn it. And because these plants have been uh, adapting to this fire-based landscape for thousands and thousands of years, um, some of these plants actually will not even flower or set seed unless there is fire that year. Um, and so they're, they're really highly adapted to, uh, to working with fire. So why have the prairies been lost? Well, one reason, of course, is a lot of the land was converted to agriculture. This started in 1837 with John Deere's invention of the steel moldboard plow and has continued to the present day. But um, an, an equally important reason, even in places that were not converted to agriculture, is that we have been systematically suppressing fire. Um, this started in earnest about 100 years ago. There was a huge wildfire in the Western United States. And right about the time when the US Forest Service was getting started, and um, they decided that they were going to suppress fire on the landscape. And Smokey the Bear uh, was part of this campaign uh, starting in the mid 1930s. And the effect of that is, is uh, you know, anybody who's lived around here for a while knows, um, this is the Wallersheim Winery outside of um, uh, Prairie de Sac, Wisconsin. And in 1870, you can see this bluff behind it was basically an open um, prairie, but by 1993, uh, that had completely uh, treed in and you can't even see the, uh, the uh, winery buildings anymore, except maybe a little bit of the roof of one of them. So the suppression of fire is really uh, uh, largely responsible for, for the loss of about 99% of the prairie and savanna that we once had on this landscape in Wisconsin. Um, so, so the fires were were being set originally by uh, the Native American people. Um, there was a little bit of fire coming from lightning, but uh, fire was really largely man-made. There's a, quite a bit of evidence for this, uh, both scientific and historical evidence um, that this is the case. And, and uh, it's clear now that fire was being used on a very widespread basis across North America very deliberately to, um, to really maintain this kind of open landscape for hunting, for transportation, um, and also to uh, uh, kind of drive a, a type of hunting and gathering uh, agriculture. Um, uh, the, the fresh green growth from uh, the year right after a fire would attract herbivores keeping it open would make it easier to hunt. And things like blueberries and, and other plants uh, would, would really thrive in a, in a fire-based landscape. So um, the First Nations people were very much using fire as a, as a technique. And we basically put a stop to it. And uh, Cecil Frost here, I love this quote that, that burning is not a disturbance, but the suppression of burning is actually a disturbance. And I, and I think we're starting to understand that a little better now than maybe we did even 20, 30 years ago with all the wildfires that we see every year across the West, um, that this idea of suppressing fire on the landscape totally is not only not really possible, but actually not at all a, a really good idea. And so I think a lot of what we're trying to do, um, particularly in the prairie enthusiasts, is to bring fire back onto the landscape, at least in this part of the world. So with that little kind of bit of introduction um, to sort of the ecology of, of fire, I want to talk a little bit about the technique um, and how we do uh, prescribe burning for those of you who are, who are not familiar with it, but may be interested. Um, and I'll say at the outset that this is uh, a very brief introduction. Um, we have, uh, we do some 
uh, fire training. Uh, it's pretty extensive for those who uh, want to do this. And um, I would not recommend doing prescribed burning um, unless you've had the training and have a, a sufficiently trained and experienced uh, crew and burn boss, et cetera. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a few minutes. So the behavior of fire, I think a lot of us learned in school that uh, there this fire triangle of oxygen, heat, and fuel. And uh, if you remove any of these three components, then you, you can put the fire out. Um, and, and that's um, uh, kind of the, the standard way we, we think about fire, particularly in connection with fire suppression. When we're doing prescribed burning, we have a little bit of a different triangle because what we're trying to do is start a fire, but also control uh, what it does and where it goes. And uh, we do that by, by also thinking about the fuel very carefully, but also thinking about the weather, the wind temperature, humidity, and precipitation or lack thereof. And the the topography, the slope and aspect of the land. And those three components, the fuel, weather, and topography are what help us actually use fire in a controlled way. So fuel, there are a lot of different kinds of fuel. Um, this is a nice contrast between uh, kind of the non-native brome grass on the left there um, which is going to pr produce a very tame fire, maybe two foot high flames. And then on the right, where you have these native warm season grasses, like this is mostly looks like Indian grass to me. Um, this could easily produce flames uh, 10 feet high under the right uh, circumstances. So knowing what kind of fuel you have um, and how that fuel is going to behave um, is extremely important and maybe the first thing to think about when you're um, uh, planning out and, and running a prescribed burn. Another um, extremely important factor in controlling how the fuel behaves and how the overall fire behaves and whether you can control it or not is the relative humidity. Um, we like to burn, generally speaking, in a range of 30 to 60 percent relative humidity. If you get above about 60 percent, you usually fire won't carry very well. Um, and below 30 percent, certainly below 25 percent, um, things become really difficult con to control. The fires can become explosive and little joke here, even, even rocks might burn uh, when you get down to really low relative humidity. So one of the things that will stop us from doing a fire, even though it looks like otherwise great conditions, is when it's too dry. Um, and so this is an extremely, extremely important thing that uh, if you haven't done prescribed burns, you, you may not really think about. The major method we use for controlling the fire is the wind direction. And so the direction and speed of the wind are the really critical determinants um, of whether we're going to be able to do a burn because the land is situated the way it is. And so the wind has to be blowing the right way. And uh, this controls whether or not you can do the, the fire. If the, like today, we'd been hoping to be doing prescribed burning all day. Um, and we really couldn't uh, down here where I am in Dane County because it was too windy. Um, and the wind was uh, quite variable in terms of direction. And so we were not gonna be able to, to control our fires properly. So a fire has very, dis or the interaction of the fire with the fuel is very dependent on the wind. The fire will always burn, of course, toward the fuel away from the area that's already been burned. And if the direction that the fire is going into the fuel is heading into the wind, that gives you a very low, slow, controlled fire that we call a backing fire. 
Um, and so this is always where you want to start a control burn is, is with a backing fire where you're burning into the wind. So even with this really tall Indian grass, um, you have very, very low flames because the wind is pushing the fire away from the direction it wants to go in. Now, the opposite of that is when the fire is, is going in the direction of the wind. And this is what we call a head fire. And this is where things get, get really dramatic. And even if the wind is blowing away from you, as it is in this case, it can be extremely hot, um, even within 10, 15 feet of this fire. So Fred here is uh, making a run for it, I think, once this head fire got started. Here's another example, a little less dramatic of a head fire, but um, this fire is moving very, very quickly. You can see from the smoke that the wind is blowing to the right. And this fire can be moving uh, even as fast as a foot or two per second, uh, can really get, get moving if, if you've got a significant wind. So here's a kind of an example of, of what this actually looks like in reality. Um, it, we would be lighting back here to the left, creating a backing fire. The wind is kind of blowing to the left. So you can see over here on the left, the, uh, the flames are relatively tame. But as soon as we get to the corner of the unit and we change direction, this tame backing fire has now suddenly become a head fire. And so, um, you know, when you think about how the, the uh, unit that you're burning is laid out on the ground, um, this is why you have to really uh, think about um, very carefully where, where you start and where you go with respect to the wind. Now, the other factor that controls which direction the fire goes in is the slope. So what I've been showing you are, are flat areas, but of course, uh, particularly uh, where, I, where I live in the driftless area, um, we have a lot of slopes, <laughs> a lot of hills, and fire will always tend to burn uphill. Um, and sometimes it'll burn quite vigorously uphill independent of which way the wind is going. And so um, you also have to take the, uh, the slope of the land into account as well as the wind. So um, the way we kind of take advantage of this is we will start a fire always with a backing fire. This is a fire in the woods. Um, oak leaves will actually burn very nicely, thank you, especially under dry conditions not quite as dramatic as that Indian grass, but it can still be very, very intense and hot fire. So when we start the fire with a drip torch, um, in this case, the, um, the wind is, um, well, I guess in this case, uh, we're lighting a head fire. The, the wind is gonna be uh, blowing to the left, as you can see from the smoke. And what happens is the, the fire actually separates. You get a backing fire where you first lit it that's moving very slowly to the right. And then the head fire is moving very quickly to the left. And once that head fire has moved away from you, you can now come along and easily suppress or put out this backing fire. And that's uh, basically the technique that we use to keep the fire from, from going into this area on the right where we, where we don't want it to go. We'll, we'll start it here, let it burn in the other direction. And then as soon as it separates like this, we'll put this originally lit fire out. So just sort of show you a, a generic sequence. If the wind is blowing from the upper left to the lower right, we will start in the lower right as far downwind as we can get. And we'll start in that corner. So we're starting a backing fire. And then we'll, our crews will spread out and one will go to the north here and one will go to the east. And they'll be lighting fire. And then that fire will be very, very slowly controlled fashion moving um, into the center. 
um, nice and slowly until we get to these corners, at which point we have to start thinking about um, the change in wind direction. And uh, we, we, because now we have uh, at least a component of the wind um, is, is uh, on this north side is, is creating a little bit of head fire. So we want this uh, crew on the south side to be ahead of the north side so that the, uh, this area is well blackened in and the fire isn't going to burn past the southern border of the unit. So then we, uh, we continue on. Uh, once both sides have turned the corner, we can move very quickly and ring the field. Um, and now we have a full-fledged head fire going uh, from the east to the west. And that will usually go very, very quickly at that point and quite spectacular. So this basic ring sequence um, is sort of the generic method that we use for, um, for doing a, a controlled burn. Now, all of this is very dependent on a number of other factors. Um, one is very careful preparation that often can start uh, even as much as a year before. Uh, and that is uh, uh, one of the most important ones is preparing fire breaks all the way around uh, the, uh, the burn unit that you're, you're trying to burn. This is an example of a really great mode fire break. You generally want the break to be about three times wider if you can do it, then the fuel is high. Um, so this is like an ideal perfect burn break. They're never like this. <laughs> Um, in reality, or very rarely, um, sometimes they're narrower. Sometimes there's there's thatch. It might have been mowed last fall, and not all greened up like this. Um, and sometimes you take advantage of natural features or roads, uh, but you do have to have some kind of defendable fire grade, something that's going to slow the fire down um, so that you you can control it. So preparation is, is really essential for this and careful planning. Um, on the crew, there's one person uh, on each side of the fire lighting. So we, we would generally have two igniters and that's it. Everybody else on the crew and a typical crew will have maybe 10 people on it, two teams of five. Um, everybody else is working on putting fire out or being able to put fire out. Um, and we can do, we use a lot of water for this. We do this with these uh, back, back can pumpers. Um, we uh, also use tools like a uh, flapper, which is uh, basically a rubber, looks like the flapper mud flap on the back of a, a truck. Uh, we can use rakes. Um, and there's some few other fire suppression tools that we use. Um, we also, uh, in recent years, we've gotten pretty uh, mechanized and uh, have a lot of trucks and ATVs and UTVs um, with pumper units and tanks on them, um, which are really nice for uh, putting out fires uh, very quickly. Um, so, a lot of equipment involved here. Um, the other really important element in this is a uh, organized, trained, and experienced burn crew. Um, we have, uh, the, with the Prairie Enthusiasts, uh, three levels that, that uh, we have in terms of the command and control of a burn. Uh, we have your crew, your sort of line crew members. Um, each of the two uh, uh, crews will have a line boss and then there's an overall burn boss. Uh, we communicate by radio. So that's a really important piece of equipment that everybody on a burn will have. Uh, and um, uh, really a lot of, lot of training at each of these levels and a lot of organization and, and planning uh, of what to do. So everybody knows what their, their role is going to be. Um, and then um, 
before this all starts, the usually the burn boss and the landowner will work together to create a burn plan. And we call this a prescribed burn plan because uh, there's a, pres a set of conditions that have to be met before we will light the fire. Um, so we'll have a range of relative humidity, a range of wind directions and wind speed, um, conditions of the fire breaks, um, types of fuel, um, size of the crew, the training of the crew, et cetera. All of these get in, in a written prescribed burn plan. And our policy as an organization is that plan has to be reviewed by someone else who has a lot of experience reviewing burn plans. Um, part of this is to notify also the local authorities, the fire department, of course, but in some cases, the DNR and some other uh, local authorities need to be alerted. So a lot goes, goes, into, doing, um, goes into doing this. So that's a really, really brief <laughs> a uh, rapid overview of, of how we do prescribed burns and a little bit of, of why we do them. Um, and I'll just uh, kind of wrap up by talking a little bit about uh, the Prairie Enthusiasts itself. Um, we as an organization started uh, in 1975 with a, uh, I'll call it prescribed burn or burn. <laughs> Uh, there was a group of, uh, of these uh, young guys who were, I think, very much inspired by um, a lot of the environmental movement, Earth Day, and some of the other things that were going on. And they were, became aware that the prairies, the last remnants of the prairies and oak savannas that had covered Wisconsin were just about to disappear. And and uh, so they really began looking systematically for them and um, realized that if they were going to protect them and preserve them, that they needed to be able to do fire. And so it, in April of 1975, I guess uh, uh, today's date actually, um, these, uh, this group of uh, young men convinced the owner of what's now the Mural Bluff Prairie State Natural Area, in Green County, Wisconsin, to let them do a 10 acre burn um, of this prairie. And uh, you can see the real sophisticated equipment and personal protective gear that, that they had. Um, these guys really had no clue what they were doing. Um, and they planned to burn 10 acres. The story goes that uh, when it got to about 130 acres, it finally ran into a cornfield and put itself out. Um, and luckily, uh, they all survived. Um, the guy second from the left here, Gary Eldred, uh, really kind of went on to found the Prairie Enthusiasts as an organization. And um, a week from uh, Saturday, he's uh, going to be inducted into the Wisconsin uh, Conservation Hall of Fame for all of the work he's done on prairies and oak savannas. Um, so I guess he'll be joining uh, Lori Otto and that uh, esteemed uh, select group there. Um, so this organization today has um, 11 local chapters in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Illinois. Um, we're very much grassroots. We have about 1,500 members in those chapters. Um, the primary focus is on actual on boots on the ground management of prairies, uh, burning, invasive species control, uh, seeding, seed collection and distribution, and uh, cutting brush and trees, etc. Um, we also do a lot of education, and we're also a um, accredited uh, land trust. Um, and we own uh, 35 uh, prairie preserves, about 2,300 acres altogether, mostly in southwest Wisconsin, although we now have a preserve up in River Falls, kind of northwest Wisconsin. All of these preserves are open to the public. So we invite you to come and see what a 
actual prairie remnant looks like uh, to model in your gardens. Um, in addition to that, we have um, a thousand acres or so of conservation easements where we own the conservation, the development rights to the property, but the landowner still owns title to the land. So um, I think you know, we have a little bit different focus than the wild ones, but I think both of us share this notion that um, unless life is precious to us, we don't cherish it and we ignore its existence. Um, and in the case of human beings, this ignorance usually destroys. This is a, a quote from Wabish Maigan, who's a Ojibwe writer who wrote a really interesting book uh, about 15 years ago called Prairie Relations um, about our <clears throat> relationship to the prairie as sold through uh, Native American stories. Um, and I, I think we also both very much relate to this uh, quote from Aldo Leopold that when we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with, with love and respect. Um, we both share this love of native plants. Um, I think we work on spreading them a little differently and preserving them differently, but I, but I think both parts of what we do are, are really, really important. And hopefully I've given you a little bit of an introduction to prescribed burning and why it's important to what we do um, at the Prairie Enthusiasts. And with that, I'll, I'll stop and uh, open this up for uh, questions. Thank you so much, Scott. That was a really yeah. introduction to uh, prescribed burning and the ecological benefits of returning to that practice. Um, we had one question that went to Paul in the chat, and that was, will fire work to suppress autumn olive in Washera County? <laughs> um, not usually by itself. Um, a lot of the shrubby plants um, and the non-native ones in particular have this um, nasty habit of, of coming back. Um, so buckthorn, honeysuckle, and autumn olive uh, fire will help keep it down. Um, but to really get rid of it, you, you really do need to uh, cut it and actually treat the stems with some kind of uh, herbicide. Um, and that's, that's also generally true of uh, things like buckthorn and honeysuckle, which is, uh, although we have a lot of autumn olive around here as well. So, so um, unfortunately fire, you know, once you have reduced it, fire will definitely um, set it back and suppress it, but um, it's not going to uh, completely, uh, completely kill it outright. Thanks, Scott. It looks like Pete posed a question in the chat and I would invite any of the other members that have a question to either jump in or write it in the chat. And so Pete says, what are the similarities slash differences between burning and mowing? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting that, you know, mowing obviously is also um, a disturbance. Um, the, um, and, and this is something we talk about quite a bit because a number of our members are very, very concerned with, um, with insects um, and particularly rare insects. Uh, a number of, of whom are uh, very vulnerable to burning. The regal fritillary butterfly that I showed a picture of there, uh, we've actually been doing an interesting kind of citizen science study that I've been involved in. The caterpillars of the regal fritillary butterfly, their host plant are prairie violets. And so the caterpillars are actually up and around at this time of year when we're typically burning, looking for violets. They overwinter as caterpillars. And so uh, you do damage regal fritillary butterfly populations to some extent by burning. Um, and so butterfly enthusiasts have been after us for years to 
stop burning because we're killing these regal fritillaries that are endangered. And what we found in doing the study is yes, when you burn the, the population diminishes somewhat, but then it generally returns uh, after a year or two. Um, and if you stop burning altogether, we do know for sure that violets will disappear because um, there are plants that come up very early and, and uh, um, are really very dependent on fire. So um, tricky, tricky business. The answer is to leave refugia where, you know, part of the unit, the property where you don't burn every year to let those populations recover. But another potential answer is, is mowing instead of burning um, and doing that maybe at a different time of year. Um, there are, mowing will do some things, but it does not uh, do everything that burning does. Um, one of the things I mentioned is that um, uh, some, actually quite a few prairie plants will not flower or set seed unless um, they are burned. Um, and uh, it, a good example of that is lead plant. Um, it just simply won't flower or set seed unless there's, there's some fire and eventually it'll disappear altogether. Um, and, <clears throat> and mowing isn't really going to, uh, going, going to help that. Um, another issue with mowing is, um, well, I, no, it's, uh, it, it, it just does not actually have, uh, have the same effect, but it does provide some disturbance and there are cases, you know, like in an urban landscape where you're, you know, you're trying to maintain one of these systems, you may not be able to burn. And mowing is certainly better than not doing anything. So a lot of, a lot of things that, uh, so I see a question, is it too late in the season to burn now or, or within a week or so? Um, the season always varies. We, as I said, we were hoping to burn today and we're certainly planning to burn tomorrow <laughs> if, the, if the conditions work. Um, and we're a little bit south of you guys in, in Dane County. Um, generally, the, the burn season is defined by uh, as soon as the snow uh, leaves the ground. Uh, on the one end and the other end when things just get too green to burn. Um, and we're getting pretty close to that. We had that warm stretch in the last few weeks, a uh, fair amount of rain and things are definitely greening up very quickly. The places we have burned this season are already starting to green up. Um, so we're expecting maybe another few days of burning. This week is probably gonna be it. Uh, and we're still hopeful, um, but it, it depends. That year, uh, what was it, 2012, when we had the big drought year, um, the burn season was done. Uh, we stopped burning on March 28th. Um, <laughs> it started really early, but uh, we, we were done before the end of March just because it was so dry um, and so warm. Um, and the last burn we did, on March 28th, it was in the 80s, and uh, the fire behavior was really weird. <laughs> so, thanks, Scott. Um, I have two questions myself. Actually, they're both unrelated to each other. The first one is: Can you talk a little bit about um, the insurance kind of end of it and the business end of protecting homeowners and things like that for mm -hmm. burns? And then my second question is how does TPE work with the indigenous community to, um, I guess, enhance practices or learn from them? Uh, two pretty diverse questions. Um, the insurance issue is, is a tricky one. Um, we have a, an organization wide burn policy uh, which is largely driven by the needs of our insurance carrier as a you know large organization that owns property, et cetera. Uh, we have quite a bit in the way of assets and, and uh, we need to obviously protect that. So we have specific prescribed burn insurance 
And the deal with that insurance is it's dependent on, on having a policy where um, we, only, we only burn with a plan uh, and that plan has been reviewed by somebody uh, who knows what they're doing. The burn is carried out by an approved uh, and highly skilled and experienced burn boss uh, with experienced and trained crew. And we have documentation for everyone who participates in the burn. The fire is not lit unless uh, we have a kind of what we call a go, no go checklist. Um, that's part of the prescription and you don't ignite the fire unless you document that you're within prescription. And then if anything does go wrong, we have an incident reporting uh, system. So, so that's kind of our deal with the insurance company to do everything we can to manage the risk. Um, and then if something does go wrong, we, you know, we can't be accused of, uh, of uh, not, not uh, of negligence, basically. Um, with a homeowner, um, you know, that it's definitely something to talk about with your insurance company. And, um, you know, unless you are an experienced burner, I, I would definitely not recommend um, burning anything other than a really small, you know, very controlled area surrounded by lawn. And even then I'd be really, really careful. If you really want to burn something like what we were looking at here, you know, either get involved with an organization like TPE or hire a contractor who will be carrying their their own burn insurance. Um, but it's definitely something to talk about with your insurance carrier and uh, with whoever is um, doing the burn and do not do a burn unless they're with them, unless they're carrying the proper insurance. So a lot more to that. We're actually in the process of um, reviewing and revising our burn insurance policy. At the moment, we put a pause on that to go out and burn. But uh, as soon as the burn season is over, we're going to be back to finishing that, that job. So the other question about working with um, First Nations communities is one of uh, really intense interest to me personally. Um, our online conference that we had at the end of February, that was kind of our, our theme in a way. And we had uh, Robin uh, Wall Kimmerer as our uh, keynote speaker to kind of talk about that. Um, I would say directly the Prairie Enthusiasts um, really doesn't have very much in the way of uh, direct ways we're working with First Nations communities in any real specific uh, way, but we have quite a bit of interest in that across the organization and, and we're beginning to make some outreach to various First Nations communities where, we're, where we have local chapters. Um, I think there's a lot of, as I've talked to people across the organization, there, there is a great deal of interest in um, how First Nation people relate to the land and take, took care of the land and do take care of the land. And, and that we see a lot of commonality between the way we think about our relationship with nature and the way um, those cultures think about their relationship with nature. And it's something that I think many, many people in TPE are, are quite interested in and are working to learn a lot about, but it's very, very early, early days for us on that. Thanks, Scott. Any other questions that members have? Feel free to throw them out now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> yeah, I think Carrie knows where to find me if uh, <laughs> anybody has any other burning questions. Oh, that was a pretty sweet joke. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all very thank much. You. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, come speak to you tonight.
Yeah, I would just, I just want to tell our members that um, if you're interested in joining the TPE, they can be found online. I myself am a member, which is how I got hooked up with Scott. And they're a wonderful group. Um, we have the local chapter here, um, I guess in the central Wisconsin, Wapaka, Stevens Point area. And they're a great resource for any kind of questions or concerns that you might have for uh, prairie management. So thank you, Scott. We really appreciate it. All right, thank you. Paul, was there anything else you wanted to add at all? Uh, just another reminder about the May meeting. It'll be on the technology and plant identification topic. So we hope to see you all then. Thanks again, Scott. Right. And have a good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Paul, just keep the uh, meeting open for a bit. Uh,